um, hello again and thank you very much uh, for uh, giving me uh, again the opportunity to know much more about cannabis from you and uh, you are uh, you helped us a lot the first time and I would um, uh, like to ask you if you could share us some news from uh, UK on cannabis, medicinal cannabis and yes. also um, if you can let's discuss some uh, patient cases that you had and with uh, some results that you saw uh, in their diseases. Thank okay. you very much Professor Bars. Good, it's a pleasure. So what's happening in the UK? Well, there's not a lot to change, but uh, what has changed, as you know from our last discussion, our National Health Service, our Government Health Service, is still not prescribing any cannabis. It, it can, but the doctors are very reluctant to, to do that. And they've been stopped, really, by uh, guidelines that have come out from some of our um, higher medical bodies who don't think much of it. Um, so that we have a problem with the concern. The conservatism of, of doctors in the UK, maybe that's the same worldwide. Um, but nevertheless, the private sector in the UK is still prescribing. We've now passed a landmark this week of uh, 2,000 patients have now been prescribed cannabis. That's, uh, you know, that sounds a lot, but we have in the UK something like 1.3 million people who use cannabis every day for medical purposes, not, not recreational, but medical purposes. So it puts it into context. We have 1.3 million users, but we've prescribed only 2,000 people legally. Um, 2,000 people is good. It's better than 200, but it's not as good as 20,000. That we'll get there. And we've also now started, since we last talked, a project in the UK called 2021. Now, 2021 is run by an organization called Drug Science. Uh, by a well-known um, scientist and, and doctor called Professor David Nutt. Uh, and their, their aim is to get 20,000 people onto cannabis medically by the end of next year, 2021, hence 2021. Um, that started and they had 7,000 people on their database and they wrote uh, on one day, they wrote to all 7,000, which wasn't too helpful because then the clinics got a rush of people saying, I'd like to be part of the project 2021. And what that involves is, first of all, they get the product cheaper. It's capped in, in UK pounds to 150 UK pounds every month, which is still a lot of money, but it's much more affordable than the ordinary private cost, which is still averaging about 500 pounds sterling every month, which is still far too much for most people. Even though that cost is about, uh, about half of what it was in January this year, it's come down by 50%. Still 500 pounds a month, 6,000 pounds a year is still an awful lot of money. For most people. So the being £150 a month is much more affordable, still expensive but much more affordable. So we're beginning to see people on the Project 2021 programme and they have to agree to uh, fill in lots of questionnaires and it's basically it's a big audit programme, it's not really a research, it's a big audit programme. So we'll accumulate several thousands of people uh, knowing what they're taking and how it's helping them or what the side effects are by the end of next year, early 2022, we'll have an awful lot of data. So that's that's good. So that started and the 2,000 patients has passed. We now have about 10 producers in the UK who can, we can write a prescription for their product, but they're still all exported. They're still all imported into the UK. They're still foreign producers. Um, and now we know in the UK there's two or three people wanting to grow and produce their own British product in the UK and they have applied for licenses. And with a bit of luck, the coronavirus is slowing things down, but there might be some UK licenses by the end of the year, which will mean some UK farmers are able to produce high THC cannabis for medical use. Hemp, hemp in the UK is legal. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it is in Romania, but hemp is, yeah. UK is legal. Uh, so we can produce um, what we call over-the-counter hemp CBD products. Uh, but that, which, have, which are fine, but they have a limited medical role. So getting some uh, products with high THC uh, requires a different license. But when we got that, we can grow our own UK medical products, which I think will be better because then there won't be a supply problem at the moment. For example, we had products from Israel 
that were coming in and then they stopped coming in. Uh, and product in Australia that we can't get out of Australia. So not helped by COVID, but also not helped by the bureaucracy of the, the, new, the old country. So if we can grow it and produce it and prescribe it within the UK, that'd be better. The, the products are, are likely to be a little more expensive because they're, they're cheaper to grow in Colombia or Africa or more, wherever, Portugal. Um, but nevertheless, there'll be a better supply chain. So that's, that's where we've got to. There's a lot of um, legal progress. We're challenging the cannabis guidelines in the UK courts. That might help because if we get better guidelines for the doctors that say, well, yeah, we can prescribe it, perhaps in limited circumstances, that will be helpful because at the moment the guidelines don't say you sh can't prescribe it, but they're not very enthusiastic. They say that basic, basically they do say you can't prescribe it, but they've wrapped it up in lots of political words. Uh, but the doctors and the hospitals they work in are interpreting that as not being able to prescribe. So if we can, if through the court, the legal system, we can get those words changed to allow doctors to prescribe it, that will be a huge step forward. So that's happening in um, this month, probably the court case. But it may not be, uh, we may not get a judgment by Christmas. That sort of so it takes several months. But may I ask you what happens with the patient who finds a prescription in another country for his disease and uh, brings yeah. the product in UK? So he's what? He's illegal, he's legal, he can have the medicine no. or not? The UK won't recognize a prescription from a, a non UK doctor. Okay. So a, a patient in the UK can't go to Holland or France or Germany and get a prescription for a German or a Dutch doctor and bring it back to the UK. They won't allow that. You can get a UK prescription and go abroad to get the product where it's cheaper. That's legal, but then you can't bring it back into the UK without an import license. And they won't give an import license to an individual, only to a company. So basically, there's nothing you do about it. And a, and a Romanian person could get a come to the UK and see a doctor and get a prescription, but then they wouldn't be able to take it back out the country uh, or their prescription from a UK doctor probably wouldn't be recognized in Romania. I don't know, but I shouldn't think so. You need a license to practice in Romania. So at the moment we're a bit stuck. We can only prescribe cannabis for UK patients in the UK. So basically what you're saying is that if a patient for, who needs the medicine brings the medicine in UK, he yeah. could be, I don't know, in jail, or he could have like a penal, uh, I don't know, sanction. I think these days they're not, they're not likely to prosecute people, but they could confiscate the product. Confiscate is bad enough for someone who is yeah, ill. Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't think they likely, they could go to prison, mm -hmm. but it's very unlikely. We have now, uh, this last week again, there's a lot happening all the time. Uh, the police Federation, that's the, or the association of all the police air chiefs in the UK, yeah. have, uh, have said that they will recognize what's called a, a cannabis card. So if a patient can't afford a private prescription, but can afford black market cannabis for medical purposes, they can get, they can get a, a confirmation from their doctor that they have a, a proper medical condition, and they can get a plastic card, like a credit card, that says I'm a medical cannabis user and then the police will say that if if they show them the card if they got cannabis in their possession and they have the card they won't prosecute them now they don't that's not the law they, yeah. don't, they could prosecute them if they thought they were perhaps too much for their personal use and they were actually selling it on the black market or something like that but basically that's the first step to decriminalizing the use of cannabis at least for medical purposes that's just been announced. That's very, that's an important step. Yeah. So people with medical conditions shouldn't be prosecuted for possessing cannabis. Well, Having said that, there's an eight, at the moment there's an 80 year old man with advanced kidney disease in the UK who is being prosecuted for growing his own cannabis and using it on himself. He's not selling it, he's just growing it in his own house for his own use and they've seized all his plants and are prosecuting him. 80 so years old. He's 80, 80 years old with terminal kidney damage, terminal kidney failure. So that's not good enough. And so that, that should stop this, this nonsense happening, hopefully. 
But what happens with the patients? I, I believe it's frustrating when the, uh, a lot of patients come to see you or other doctors, private clinics, and they uh, get a prescription and they basically found, find out how to administrate cannabis, but they don't have the medicine. So mm. how the, I mean, there are still uh, patients who come to the private clinics and uh, want to ask uh, advice from a doctor or not? There is no interest yeah. now. Well, you can go and see a doctor and get advice and say, yeah, would you be uh, suitable for prescription? Mm -hmm. and then not get the prescription because they couldn't afford it. They can do that. They'd have to pay the doctor, of course. Yeah. But at least they can be reassured, yes, cannabis will be suitable for me and for my condition. And then they can go away and they can find it if they want on the black market. And some people are doing that, but it's not very good. Of course. Um, but it's a safer way of doing it than just going yourself onto the black market and buying it because you, you don't know whether you're suitable for it, whether your condition will help, what dose you take. So getting some good medical advice about it, at least is a step in the right direction. Um, but I think we're getting there and I think there's rumours now that the Channel Islands, Jersey and Guernsey, will um, make it much easier for people to obtain cannabis. There's been an election in Guernsey this week um, and all the, no next week, and all the candidate or most of the candidates are in favour of legalising cannabis. So if we get legal cannabis on Guernsey, then I think it'll be a very short time before we get legal cannabis in the UK. Because you can't have it legal in one little... Guernsey is a separate island. It's got its own government, yeah. but it's very closely linked to the UK. And there's no border control. So you, can, you could get cannabis in Guernsey and fly back to the UK with it without being stopped. So as soon as that happens, the government will have to think rethink the whole of the cannabis legislation, I think. What happens with the child that uh, you f uh, you first uh, started the fight for uh, a child with her his mother? Uh, his mother, yeah, I work closely with Hannah Deacon, yeah. who is the mother of a, the first child that got a cannabis prescription in the UK called Alfie Dingley. Yeah, Alfie is doing very well. I'm sure his mother won't mind me telling you. I mean, his story was very good. Did I tell you last time? I I don't. Uh, but yeah. an up to date on Alfie. Is he's now had no seizures again for he had no seizures for about a year, eleven months. Then he had some seizures returned much better than they were, much better. But he still had seizures for about a year. Then we tried to control it with different types of cannabis and different strains. And eventually, about four months ago, his seizures stopped again. And now for four months he's been without seizures. That's and remember, he had three to four hundred seizures every month before all this happened. So even when he, even when the seizures returned, he was only getting a little cluster of two or three seizures about once every two weeks. So it was hugely better. But now it's better, much better again because he's having none. He's having none for the last four months. So what happens? Uh, he, she can bring the treatment for her child now in UK. Yes, she um, she is. There's two patients in the UK that have a national health service prescription, free, and the government on the government health service, um, just two. And both of those were before the law changed. They made an exceptional license for those two, and that license has continued. And Alfie is one of them, and another child in Northern Ireland is another one. So that's two people in the whole of the country who have a National Health Service prescription. But isn't it a discrimination? Yes. So, yes. I mean, it's like, I'm, I'm, I, I didn't practice for such a long time. I'm a lawyer, basically, but this like is a, a, a very clear case of discrimination. I mean, it's very good that yes. these two people have the right, but what about yes. the other thousands or... Well, exactly. Yeah, it's just yes. all wrong. Maybe. They say, well, that was done before the law changed, so it's a different... Not as though they've been prescribed under the present law, but it's a bit of a subtle difference, to be honest. It's, it's not fair or reasonable. So a lot of people are making that case, and that's why they're taking uh, the government to court. Mm -hmm. to say that the guidelines produced by a government body called NICE, National Institute for Clinical Excellence, um, they're taking that body to court, which is a government body, to say that your guidelines are unfair and discriminatory and mm -hmm. preventing prescription for other people. So the whole thing is ridiculous. Yes. But it's it's you know, totally ridiculous and unfair and discriminatory, as you say. So I think it will change, but I think 
if you interview me in a year's time, I hope we'll be in a much better place. It is getting, it is getting there. The prices are coming down. More people are being prescribed. More choice available. But it's all still too expensive for most families can't afford that. The people having to go fundraising, they're having coffee mornings and raffles and they can't afford it out of their own money. So they're having to raise the money from charity and things like that. That's that's just awful. Exactly. They shouldn't have to do that. But what can you tell me about CBD? You told me that it's legal, hemp is legal. But yes. uh, we discussed also last time about how can you find out which product is good and which product is not? Because we have some cases yeah. in Romania and uh, there are some, I mean, we have some analysis from some of the products and not all the products have the level of, uh, uh, you know, yeah. uh, the, the quality or the, um, how do you say, the um, uh, concentration of CBD. Uh, the way they say, they state it. So, because yeah, exactly. we have clear, a very clear law, we don't even have a law on CBD. Yes. We cannot uh, find, I mean, a lot of people ask me also, how can I choose a good CBD? And I cannot answer <laughs> this question because it's yeah. very difficult. I don't know the situation in UK, so. You're quite right, it is very difficult. Um, we've, I've just done this morning, actually, uh, uh, the first draft of a good CBD guide. So people, because there's a lot of products on the market and it's very confusing, be also because the people making those products can't tell the public about any medical value because they're, they're not licensed as a medicine. Yeah. So you can't say this one is good in this dose for back pain or this one at this dose is good for your anxiety. You can't say that. You can say it helps your wellness or some vague um, thing it's, like it's a cosmetic use and uh, cosmetic, yeah, wellness products, stress products, yeah. um, aches and pains, but nothing that's got a medical label, yeah. which is crazy. That's another craziness. So how would you tell? I mean, what we say to people in the UK is insist you see what's called a certificate of analysis. Now, every product should have, mm -hmm. every good product should have a certificate of analysis. So it's just a, a printout of what's in that batch of CBD. So how much CBD has it got in it? How much other products, how many terpenes, how much THC it's got in it? Whether it's free of impurities, all those things. So if you buy a product, I think you should demand to see a certificate of analysis. Then you know exactly what's in it mm -hmm. uh, and see whether what's in it is actually what's on the label, because sometimes it doesn't reflect what's on the label. Uh, and you know it's pure and you know it's been properly tested. Now, OK, you can make up test certificates, so it's still open to some abuse. But generally speaking, if it's a th an independent laboratory that's done those test certificates, mm -hmm. that's, the, that's the thing you should look for, I think, and see what's in it, basically. Um, and then you need to look at the websites to see what dose you should take, because the manufacturers won't tell you. So if you've got pain, the average dose is for hemp CBD is about 60 to 100 milligrams a day. Uh, stress the same sort of dose. Epilepsy is much, much higher. But but you've got to find that out yourself. And a lot of people don't quite know how to do that or they don't understand uh, what's written about it. It's um, So it's very unsatisfactory. Calculate also because you said 60 to 100, but pure yeah. CPD, not diluted. So some of yeah. them don't know some how say, to... Some yeah. say percent. 5% yeah. CBD, well, 5% of what? How do you work 5% out into milligrams? Yeah. So, you know, and I can't, I find that difficult. So most yeah. people out there, would find, they won't know what they're doing. So I get a lot of questions several each week from people saying, I have back pain or I have what? Or, and I've bought this CBD from a health food shop. Please tell me how much to take. And it's very difficult for me to answer that because I often don't know what they've bought and I have to go through and I say, well, what's in it? And they say, well, it doesn't say anything on much on the label. It just says it's hemp CBD. And then I can't tell them how much to take because I don't know what's in it. So the whole hemp CBD industry is a mess as well. It needs, it needs some, it doesn't need too much regulation. I don't like over-regulating. Of course. It does need some regulation so people can know what they're taking and how much to take. The problem is that meantime, uh, some people lose interest and also uh, confidence in uh, CBD. And because yeah. here in Romania, some patients didn't get results with CBD. And then yeah. they say, 
it's it's not a good product. So uh, therefore, if CBD is not good, also cannabis is not good. Like you right, know. Right. So, yeah, 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 you're absolutely right. But again, that may be because hemp CBD hasn't got all the terpenes and the cannabinoids of proper cannabis. Or it may be that just taking such a, a low dose is not going to do any good. Of but course. they don't know they're taking a low dose. So, you know, five milligrams, 10 milligrams of CBD is probably not going to be any help to anybody. So you, they dismiss it. This is this is rubbish. This is no good. And you're quite right that they, they throw away what might be good for them if they took more or took a better product. It's a uh. shame. I wanted to ask you also about uh, the project 2021. What kind of diseases they uh, patients with? With what kind of diseases? Uh, yeah, it's not. Um, it's it, it will cover most of the common ones. It, they can is prescribed for pain, mm -hmm. um, anxiety, post-traumatic stress disorder, Tourette's syndrome, mm -hmm. uh, and substance misuse disorder. That's basically cannabis dependency. Because mm -hmm. there's some evidence that if you if you're, for want of a better word, hooked on cannabis, you mm -hmm. can um, come off that by substituting high THC for low THC, high CBD products. <coughs> so it's a way to get people less dependent on cannabis, mm -hmm. ironically. That, I think that's those. There's pain, stress, uh, well, anxiety rather, PTSD, uh, Tourette's and substance misuse disorder. Um, not epilepsy, because it was so cheap from the manufacturer's point of view, and epilepsy people need so much more than ordinary pain. Mm -hmm. They might need three or four times as much. They couldn't let the people with epilepsy have it at that price. Mm -hmm. uh, so there needs to be some more negotiation to say, well, okay, if you can't do it at that price, can you do it at a slightly higher price so people with epilepsy can, can also benefit? But at the moment, epilepsy is excluded from 2021. And there's a limited number of products that you can prescribe. You can only prescribe those from the producers that have signed up to the project. Mm -hmm. um, and there's not much choice in those products. We're very limited on flour, for example, very limited. We haven't really got any CBD flour. So Project 21 is a great idea, but it's not quite um, the finished product, if you like. It needs a bit more work to get it right for, for most people. And the people who have the right to join the project are only from UK? Yes. Okay. Because of the prescription problems. Yeah. Uh, from Romania, for example, I think they'd love to be part of Project 2021, yeah. but how do you get the product? You've got to come to, the, you can't get it in Romania because a UK doctor can't prescribe for a Romanian person in Romania. And if a Romanian person comes across to the UK, they probably could get a prescription, but then they couldn't take it back home again. But, but they uh, could. They can risk smuggling it, of course they can, but yeah. you know, legally they can't take it back home again. Only for Romanians in UK, if uh, some Romanians yeah, are watching Yeah, if Romanians in the UK, yeah. then they can get it legally in the UK and stay within the UK and take it. Yes, that's right. I, as you know, I already asked you in private because I have some people who are interested in uh, finding out how to administrate cannabis and also CBD and THC. And they asked me about what you're saying about prescription. They wanted to fly to UK to take the prescription. And uh, yes. I explained what so you already explained to me. But, you know, there is uh, this lack of information. And that for some of them, even though uh, they could not take the medicine or the prescription, uh, only the information is uh, also useful. So, you know, yeah. because... There are a lot of, um, you know, nonsenses, I mean, information. Some people, uh, we talked earlier about CBD. Some of the people who recommend CBD say you should take three to five drops. Which, what does it mean, three to what five? What does it mean? Yeah, what does it mean? How strong uh, is the drop? How yes. many kilograms do you have? I also exactly. heard that. Because of the weight, if you have, um, uh, I don't know, higher weights, uh, you should take, 10 drops or you know so it's like the information is not um, that precise and uh, so yeah. for some of the people it's important also to discuss with a doctor who even even if he cannot give them the prescription it's important to talk to someone who knows about how to prescribe and how to administrate you know yes. so, there's a lot of misinformation as you say if somebody says take 10 drops I mean, it's meaningless yeah, 10 course. drops of what? 
10 drops of how strong are the drops, you know, it, 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 it makes no sense. So after that, you know, I told you the disappointment and then they lose interest, they lose confidence and then they they think that also cannabis is a waste dream. It's not, it's something that's an illusion yeah. and yeah. it's nothing because it's easily yeah. to take a, a, a pill, you know, and if you yeah. have pain, you get the pill and that's it. So yeah, it's very sad, but maybe it's uh, we could I don't know think of a s solution with some doctors from other countries also with you if you want to have like online consultations for people all around. I mean, who wants to find out some answers from proper doctors from proper professionals, you know? So yes, yes. We should talk about this also. So I wanted to ask you about some cases because it's very important to know uh, about the patients who use cannabis and if you saw results and if you can share with us some cases, yeah. uh, I think it, it will be important. Yeah, well most, um, I can give you the experience in the medical cannabis clinics in the UK, uh, in our clinic, that's, and we've seen a thousand patients as I said earlier out of 2000 UK. So we see about half of the people in the UK. Uh, about 60% of those who come to the clinic are adults with pain, all sorts of pain. But a typical one was a person was uh, two weeks ago, was a man who um, had fallen down. He was a, a, um, a construction worker. He'd fallen over in, on the construction and damaged his back. And initially he was paralyzed, but the paralysis of had worn off largely. He wasn't walking normally, but he was walking and getting it wasn't back at work because he, he couldn't climb over the construction sites and things. But uh, but he was left with a lot of residual pain, back pain and pain down the legs as well um, from that injury. So and he tried all the normal painkillers. And we in the UK, you have to have tried at least two, if not more, <coughs> licensed products. So say, for example, um, gabapentin or uh, diloxetine or something. So, but he tried all sensible licensed products without any real effect at all. And he ended up on opioids and uh, amitriptyline, which is an antidepressant, uh, but also has painkilling properties. So he was on those, but it wasn't really being helped. So he tried illegal street cannabis, uh, vaped, um, and smoked, but I think no, smoked, sorry, not vape, smoked, and he found it very helpful. <coughs> but he didn't really want to be illegal. He wanted, a, and also wanted to guarantee the quality. Um, and so he came to the clinics and we gave him a prescription of proper uh, um, legal, uh, high quality flour. Um, and at the moment in the UK, actually, because of COVID, the street price has gone up and the prescription price is around the same as the street price, ironically. It doesn't cost much more, if at all, to get a prescription now for a flower. And of course, he's very happy with that. <coughs> of course, he has, um, he has, he's legal again. He doesn't have to get it from the black market, from criminals. Um, if he's stopped by the police, he can justify the fact he's got a legal prescription. It doesn't cost him much more money. His was a little more money, about a pound a gram more. And he smokes about a gram, a gram a day. So that was costing him about, therefore, about 30 pounds sterling more every month than it would have been if he'd gone on the black market. But he was much happier, because that's not a lot of money. Um, and he's much happier because of the purity and the legality of it. And he'd done really well. Um, he's now off the opioids. It's early, it's early days. We saw him, we saw him two weeks ago for the first follow-up. So he's now been on the stuff for that six or seven weeks, something like that. Um, and it's his early days, but uh, at the moment he's, he's come off already, he's come off the opioids. He still remains on amitriptyline because we don't want to do everything at once. And he's very happy with the result. He's walking, his walking isn't better, but he's walking with less pain and his sleep is also better. Because the other thing we shouldn't forget is cannabis is not just a painkiller in his circumstance, but it helps sleep. It reduces anxiety, <coughs> which is also an issue for him. He was quite anxious about himself and his future. <coughs> Excuse me, coughing. Hope I've got the virus. 
No. Oh. <laughs> Actually, uh, I found out that, uh, you know, the some people say that with COVID, there's also good medical cannabis. So <laughs> we're yes, discussing about it's cannabis. So, so he, and he was a man in his late 40s, I think, from memory. Um, so he was one example, and that's a very common type of example. And uh, overall, about... 80% of so far of our follow-up figures, 80%, I think it was 79% or something, um, are, are suited by the cannabis medication. Now, some people you get it right first time, like him. Some people can take two or three or four follow-up visits to adjust the dose, increase the dose, decrease the dose, swap to a different strain. Uh, but if you take all that into account, overall, about 80% of people with pain are helped by cannabis enough to continue on the medication from a brilliant result, you know, almost no pain or just a little bit of benefit, but they still have pain and still on other painkillers. So there's a, quite a variation of result, um, but 80% overall are helped. And that leaves 20%, of course, of aren't, you wouldn't expect any medicine to help everybody, uh, but about 20% of people aren't helped or not helped enough to say, I, okay, I've tried it. It's not helped. I want to stop this now. Thank you. So that's good. That's one example. Is he using also CBD? With no, that's no. a good question. A lot of people who've tried vaping or smoking uh, don't really want to try background oil. Mm -hmm. We do try and persuade them to take an oil as well, a CBD oil, um, because it reduces the, as you know, it reduces the high of the THC. Um, and also it's a better, they get a background effect on oil because it lasts six or eight hours. Mm -hmm. So you take it two or three times a day and you get a background pain killing effect. And then if you've got extra pain, you can take a vape to get over that breakthrough pain as they call it. Um, but we find interesting, a lot of people who've already tried smoking or vaping, don't actually want to try an oil. They find the vape much better for their pain even though they have to vape every couple of hours. Mm -hmm. So they get that, that boost is helpful to them. So they don't particularly want a background oil. If people haven't tried an illegal product um, and they're new to cannabis, we always say we must try the oil first because then some of them, about 20%, won't need anything else. They just need CBD oil. Yeah. Some will need a higher strength oil, a THC added into the oil, and some will then need vaping as well. But we always try and persuade them to start on a CBD oil for the background analgesia. Um, related to this, I want to ask you uh, if uh, his work is affected. Yes. And also, um, because you talked about strains, there is also a very interesting question about strains. How do you, how does someone know what strain to choose? Indica, sativa, hybrid? I mean, it's like a never-ending yeah. discussion also on this well, subject. It's a long, difficult discussion. I think yes. there is some general truth that sativa varieties are more uplifting, creative. They don't make you sleepy, whereas indica varieties do tend to make you sleepy. Yeah. I think probably uh, the trouble is at the moment that most, most strains are hybrids. Mm -hmm. um, and that you can get in the UK, we have one... one product was indica. So what the doctors will tend to do is prescribe the other products for the daytime use. Mm -hmm. And if sleep's a problem, they'll, they'll swap to the indica product for the evening. Mm -hmm. So then they, they can help their sleep. This chap didn't, but several people do have a sativa product in the daytime and an indica product for night. So they're not, they're not high, uh, they're not because they're asleep, yeah. uh, but it helps, it helps their sleep. Uh, I'm not sure I believe in sativa versus indica, but I think it, all, it will depend on what the what cannabinoids are in it. So it's not a, it's not a phenomena of the plant type; mm. it's a phenomena of the cannabinoids and terpenes that are in the plant type. Um, if you see what I mean. So the, when we learn more about cannabinoids and terpenes, I think we'll prescribe on the cannabinoid and terpene profile, and not a sativa strain or an indica strain. But at the moment, you're quite right. Um, well, we only have one indica strain available. How do you pick the other strains or oils? Um, it's largely dictated for us because of relatively limited choice. Um, there's probably not that much difference between the different consumers. 
they're all slightly different strains. So if one doesn't work, you'd swap to another because they've got slightly different cannabinoids and terpenes, and therefore you might be a better effect. Mm -hmm. Some of the children with epilepsy swap around every month. So they have a, one strain for a month, then they swap to another strain for a month, then they're back to the first strain for the next month. And that seems that stops tolerance developing. So that's one way to do it. Um, yeah, so... So to be clear, uh, uh, sorry, to be clear, when, once we have the law, hopefully here in Romania, if a strain doesn't work, it's uh, yeah. for a patient, it's recommended to uh, to swap to another strain, to yes. keep trying. Yes. Keep Maybe trying. Like another yeah, strain. Well, many use. people, many people we've seen, who, who one strain has not really worked, or not worked very well, mm -hmm. they've swapped to another strain, so the same total dose of CBD or THC, but because they've got other mixture of cannabinoids and terpenes, they, they have been helped. Mm -hmm. And particularly the children with epilepsy, we've seen many who are not helped on one strain, but are helped on another strain, even with the same dose of CBD. Mm -hmm. So the strain is very strain specific and not surprising. If there's 147 cannabinoids and 100 terpenes, yeah. no strain is going to be the same as the other strains. It's like taking, a, 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 if you like, a different medicine, a different mixture. Um, so it's not surprising it help one strain helps some people and not others. Um, and about uh, his work, uh, he could. His work, well, he was, I say, he was a construction worker yeah. on a building site, a labourer. Um, he's not back at work. I don't think he will be because of his walking will probably never be quite the same. So he's not going to be up to the strength and agility required to work on a construction site. And up, But up to recently, he couldn't work anyway because the pain was so disabling for him. But he could, if the pain is helped, as it seems to be, then there's no reason why he couldn't train or try and get another job that's not quite so um, physical. Yeah. Because he's a bright, he's a bright man. He could he have to retrain, I think. So I don't think he uh, will actually get back to his old job. If he'd been an office worker or something like that, um, and he, the pain was stopping him working, I think he would be back to his old job. So what I was asking was that um, in some cases or in some countries, I've heard that if you have like a job, like a, I don't know, driver or uh, some other, I don't know, jobs like you should have like uh, some the agility and all the presence and you know uh, it's it's not allowed for you to continue with the treatment so um, is it the the difference also in UK um, if people need some treatment no matter if they're I don't know uh, drivers professors doctors or is it a problem when you do that job Sorry, for, so again, so for some jobs. Yes, in some jobs, you yeah. have like uh, this difficulty if you take uh, THC, if you take cannabis. So oh, I see what you mean. Yeah. It's not allowed for them to use cannabis. Yes, no, that's, so, that's a problem. Not yeah. many jobs, but some, they will be drug tested. Yeah. yeah. For things like drivers, as you say, yeah, um, signalmen on the railways, train drivers, they'll get drug tested. The problem with THC is that it's stored in the fat cells in the body and comes back out into the bloodstream slowly over several days. So even if you take one vape mm -hmm. at a weekend or something, you will, and you're perfectly fine by Monday morning, mm -hmm. um, you're not impaired in any way, you're not high in nothing at all, but you'll still have detectable levels of THC in your blood. Mm -hmm. And that could be an issue for drug testing. Um, and that's the problem. There's nothing you can do about it. And obviously people with THC products will have to take them almost certainly every day. So they can't just take them at weekends like recreational users. Okay. Um, so that's an issue. And all we suggest in the UK is that they tell their employers uh, what they're taking. Because if they're just found out, they'll assume to be just a recreational and illegal users and they'll probably get, lose their job. Um, so tell the employers, get a letter from the doctor saying this is a legitimate use and let work with the employer to make sure the person is not impaired during their job. But but look at them, supervise the actual job and not rely on a blood test. Mm -hmm. So, of course, if they are a little bit impaired with THC, for example, they shouldn't do that work. Mm -hmm. But look at the actual performance on the job and not just the results of a blood test is what we tell them. It hasn't been a big issue. Uh, but it could be and the other thing in the UK. There was a, a high 
there's a THC limit for driving, like alcohol, mm -hmm. and that's very low, and it will be you'll be over the limit if you have any medical cannabis with THC in it. Um, fortunately, we're not aware of anyone who's been prosecuted in the UK on a result of a blood test for driving with high THC. Which is the for, limit? For medical usage. Uh, so it doesn't seem to be a practical issue, but it's a, it's a, theoretically it's an issue mm -hmm. that you shouldn't really drive if you're taking a THC product because you'll be over the legal limit. That's another thing that the, the lawyers and the government and the politicians need to sort out. Yeah. You can't help someone who's not impaired, perfectly capable of driving, but is over the legal limit. It's just oh, equally crazy. Correct. Um... So, uh, uh, you, do you have also some other patient cases apart to this? Um... Um, yeah, the other one I remember, uh, well, there's the epilepsy one I've talked about with Alfie. I do the, the, the three. Pain is the, the next commonest for the clinics is anxiety. Mm -hmm. And there was, as a lady, I remember, this was, goes back a few months now, was a, a young lady. Um, she'd had, um, after the birth of her child, she had got um, post natal depression which yeah. had which had recovered mm -hmm. but she was also had a lot of anxiety that tr was triggered by the postnatal came on with the postnatal depression and was still there and it was really very disabling anxiety uh, she was looking after the baby mm -hmm. she hadn't been looking after the baby for some a few months after the birth she was too depressed but she was back to looking after the baby uh, but she was quite disabled by anxiety um, which is common in young mothers anyway, but, um, you know, this was really disabling anxiety. <laughs> um, so uh, she had not been a user before. Um, she tried, again, the usual licensed medication anti-anxiety drugs like the benzodiazepines, which she didn't like because that she felt that was impairing her further, making her more tired in the daytime, not able to look after the baby as much. Um, so she tried them and failed on them and didn't like them. So again, we gave her um, a CBD, because CBD is the main thing for anxiety, not THC. We gave her a CBD oil, uh, and it took two or three goes to get the dose right and that we swapped strains. It was okay, but not brilliant. So we swapped strains, it was better, we increased the dose, and it was a bit better still. And so now she is on, I think there's quite a high dose for it's about 120 milligrams from memory, mm -hmm. which is a bit higher than average, but everyone's very different. Of course. So she's on a, a, a full spectrum mm -hmm. um, CBD product. So it's not a hemp based CBD product. It hasn't got, it has a little bit of THC in it because the full spectrum products will have almost no, certainly have a little bit of THC in, yes. but not much. So it's mainly a full spectrum CBD product at 120 milligrams as an oil. Mm -hmm. If you take that three times a day, and she's now a lot better. Uh, she feels much, she does get a little anxious in particular circumstances still. She's a little bit anxious when she goes to the shops still, so going outside, but inside the house where she feels more secure anyway, she's much less anxious and she says she's much better and they now much more able to look after the child. So she says she's about 70, 80% better. And we should, that's another point, we shouldn't think that cannabis is going to cure. We wouldn't expect her to have 100% totally cured, no anxiety at all. Uh, it's not that brilliant. Um, it can be for some people, but not always. So that, that was a good, nice example of someone, again, who'd been helped uh, by a simple CBD oil. Maybe it's not curing, but uh, because she's not taking some other pills, uh, CBD yeah. does not have side effects. And well, so, that's, that's true. She will suffer from the side effects, the anti-anxiety medication. And the CBD can have side effects in high doses. Yeah, it can stomach pain, diarrhea, sometimes a bit of drowsiness, sometimes a dry mouth. But generally speaking, you don't get many side effects. And she didn't have any side effects. So that's great. So that was another good example. Um, I wanted to ask you something because you mentioned earlier that... Um, in UK, you should uh, you can try uh, cannabis after you are you tried two licensed uh, uh, medicines, yeah, products yeah. in UK. So uh, the same situation is in Malta, as I discussed also with the doctor from Malta. And I wanted to ask you uh, in UK, a patient, how can he demonstrate that he took some other two products and then he wants to swap to cannabis? Or yeah. I mean, it's like 
you should have like a, a proof of something or he can yeah. Really say yeah you should yeah, have what we do we have to we're obliged but when someone comes to the clinics they fill in a big questionnaire yeah. It takes about 20 minutes. It's quite detailed about what's happened to them, what they've taken, what's worked, what hasn't worked, whether they've taken cannabis before or not, whether they've had history of schizophrenia, all that stuff. Yeah. Um, that's quite comprehensive. Now, of course, they could make that up. Uh, so what we also have to do is we write to their general practitioner, their primary care physician, and we require them to the GP to send us a copy of their notes or a summary of their notes. So that will that will back them up. That will confirm that they've got they have genuinely got back pain or they've got anxiety or whatever it is, and they will list the, the things they've tried. And so we we are obliged. Um, we are we're governed by a body called the CQC, the Care Quality Commission, and they will come and inspect us and make sure that we and audit our records and make sure that we have asked them. Um, we've seen the GP records and we've confirmed they're a genuine patient and they've tried at least two licensed medications. So we, we can't rely on the patient being honest. I'm sure most will be, but there'll be some who won't be honest. Yeah. Um, so we, we check on them, basically. And if they won't give us permission to approach their GP, then we don't see them. No, but what do you think about uh, the, the two licensed products that he should test before? Because in some cases, yeah. maybe uh, he has a sickness that, I don't know, yeah. He should not use some uh, traditional medication. Yeah, you're right. It's a very difficult area. Um, and we also thought, what about if someone who has mental capacity who says, thank you, I don't want to, I'm not taking opioids. Yeah, or, of course. I mean, I'm not doing it. Yeah. Um, but the, the, the law at the moment, or the regulations at the moment, are that if they haven't, we can't prescribe for them. So we have to tell them, go to your doctor if you haven't done it go to your doctor you have to get a licensed medication that's suitable for this condition and you have to have tried it and failed on it or you but, could have tried it and said i'm sorry this is i got unacceptable side effects I, it doesn't suit me at all give me the second one and you try that and you can say i haven't these are unacceptable side effects as well thank you very much i've tried too so you know there's not a way you can prove that the person has actually taken what they've been prescribed yeah. Course. But what we have to do is make sure they have actually been prescribed to at least to proper licensed medications. You know, and then some we have to rely on them to say, you know, it didn't work. They lose time and you lose some, you know, paper, filling papers and so on. And you know for sure that most of the people who uh, know about um, some things about cannabis, they don't want to try some... Uh, no, 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 they don't, you're right. Course. So yeah, yeah. No, it, it, the, the the UK government decided it should not be a medicine of first resort. It should be a medicine of last resort. I don't agree with that at all, but that's what we have to be seen to do these days. But the problem is that it's not only in UK, as I'm seeing in some other yeah. countries around Europe. And I wonder uh, why is it like a practice all around Europe? Because I don't think that in the United States or Canada is the same thing. So I don't know why Europe prefers like this, no. like safe to play it safe. No, like well, it could be and also it could be pressure from the pharmaceutical industry. Probably because they're going to lose. They're going to lose revenue. They're going to use profit. Because if less, if 25% less prescription of opioids when you license yeah. legal cannabis, 25% less profit. Yeah. And there is definitely, I, I don't like these conspiracy theories too much, but definitely yeah. there is lobbying from the pharmaceutical industry that will try to stop the cannabis industry. There's no doubt about that. I, I know that's the case. Um, so that's the other reason that politicians are very prone to, um, I've got to be careful what I say here, I'm, I'm sure it doesn't happen in Romania. Um, no. No. Uh, the corruption and, and uh, you know, lobbying and, uh, you know, politicians are prone to, prone to, to hearing having opinions. people's needs, yeah, yeah, to hearing, uh, to hearing the problems of, I mean, it's like we're, we're uh, joking about it, but it's not to joke about the subject because as you maybe remember, my mother had a kidney failure a bit before I started to administrate cannabis, so, she was not suitable to be administ to administrate her some pills because she could the the first of all the kidney failure was yeah. because of the pills that administrate opioids you know so it's like um, 
it's not uh, a law like that is not good for the no, sake of people it's, it's not. not in their favor because some of people yes. some of them they could not use the i think in the uk you could probably because it's not actually part of the law okay. it's part of the regulation yes. so i think if you adopt a properly documents yeah. so this patient cannot try that because it's not safe for them or cannot yeah. try that because they're allergic to this or something like that Okay. Uh, but they've thought about it and they've said, no, I don't want that for good reason. And the doctor's written that down, then yeah. probably you could prescribe cannabis without trying other licensed medications. Um, so it's, that, that will be legal, but it okay. wouldn't be what the UK authorities view as good practice. So you could do it, actually. OK, uh, I wanted to ask you something uh, about um, oncological patients. Uh, you have, um, I don't know, NGOs, charities in UK with patients that, you know, cannabis is also prescribed in uh, some uh, oncological cases or also in some uh, autoimmune diseases. And um, I wonder if these patient, patients or these charities don't gather and, uh, I don't know, put pressure also to uh, leave them the right to also use cannabis because you know we are we started to talk about cannabis in most of the european countries and we are talking only about it's it's not um, um, i mean a small thing to suffer from anxiety or depression but it's not cancer so I believe that we should also talk about, um, I don't know, autoimmune diseases and cancer and yes. do much more studies and trials on patients that are willing to try cannabis because, yes. as, as I told you, my mother was a four-stage patient cancer and we didn't have like trials to put her in. We didn't have medication to put her in. So for these patients, I believe that we should think also in their uh, possibility and their willingness if they want to be uh, part of a study or uh, like in tw Project 2021, uh, if yes. they're willing and they want to uh, test cannabis, why not? I mean, it's... Yeah, we can prescribe. Um, there's no limit in the UK as to what conditions we can prescribe for. And we have seen some people with cancer. Mm -hmm. uh, we're very careful to say, of course, that it's not necessarily going to cure your cancer. Uh, it may do nothing for the cancer, but we shouldn't forget if you've got cancer, you might have pain, you might have anxiety, you might have problems sleeping, you might have poor appetite, yeah. you might have epilepsy. So you, you can justify, I think, quite reasonably, cannabis use in cancer, even if it's not for the cancer, but for the symptoms associated with it. But we can prescribe and have seen people prescribe for cancer. And there's many th examples on the internet as you know, people being cured of their cancer. Now, I'm not going to, we need much more trials. I think it will help some cancers, not other cancers. There's some evidence that it can help some types of breast cancer, sometimes a brain tumor like glioblastoma, sometimes a pancreatic cancer. Um, that seem to be particularly THC sensitive, but I, we don't know enough about it yet. Um, but for people with cancer, and also particularly if there's nothing else, if the doctor says there's nothing else I can do for you, I had a call this morning from a, uh, someone in Guernsey whose brother has now disseminated cancer and the doctors have said, there's nothing else we can do for you. And he said, should I try, his brother asked me, Could, should I try um, cannabis? And I said, well, why not? You know, there's nothing to lose. And he, he doesn't have much pain at the moment, but he does have a lot of anxiety and poor sleep and poor appetite. So he said, if it doesn't help the cancer, it might help those things. So why not? You know, if I had that disseminated cancer, I would try it. There's no harm in trying it. So yeah, and autoimmune. I don't think from memory we've seen anyone with autoimmune disease yet in the clinics, but you're oh, right. Yes. Um, cat, um, CBD and THC are both immunosuppressant. They are anti-inflammatory. And so they, there's a perfectly good case for trying it. And you know, there's some studies in COVID, isn't there, and, uh, for cannabis. Uh, in the later stages of COVID, those who are very ill and have got inflammation, the body's immune system is, is going overdrive to active and uh, taking cannabis for the end stages of COVID. Uh, there's two a study in Canada and a study in Israel on that at the moment, so it could have be relevant for, for COVID even. Maybe this COVID problem now could help us uh, in a 
very yeah. ironic way with the cannabis. It could be, yeah. The moment. And it may be the other way. I've been done an article recently where um, the government, after all this, in most countries, will will have to think about tax revenue and they'll have to think about jobs. And so why not stimulate a new industry that provides a lot of jobs and a lot of income from tax? Why not start a cannabis industry? And that, you know, that, that's a time when we really do need a big economic stimulus. I'm sure Romania is the same. You've invested a lot of, it's cost a lot of money to fight COVID and, and a lot of economic damage. Yeah. Um, so why not start a new industry to help help a little bit in that? So it might be a stim. COVID, ironically, might be a stimulus we need to to kickstart a proper cannabis industry. Um, I wanted to ask you also about the law because we talked about the law in UK. But um, considering all the aspects that we discussed about, um, and because I hope that from other countries' example, I could also share. Uh, from my experience and from what I hear from you um, to our officials here, I want to ask you which could be the main difficulties or main problems in adopting or passing a law on uh, medical cannabis and um, if there are some points that we should be careful not to, I don't know, not to follow the example from other countries or, I don't know, to adjust something or, uh, I don't know how to say it, but I want to give like uh, specific details from for other countries, not only for Romania, for people who are uh, listening to us and could make a difference in other countries, not to, uh, I don't know, uh, pass a law and then to try to adjust it and try to make a... Uh, yes some, you know, adjustments. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think I think the UK law is actually not bad. Mm -hmm. And I think, um, surprise, I mean, there's no prescription, but that's the doctors being conservative and difficult and not the law. I think we got the, the, the government at the time, the Home Secretary at the time, got the law quite good because you can prescribe for any condition. Mm -hmm. And I think that's important so you don't exclude some conditions and not others, because the evidence for excluding one or not another is very thin. So I think it should be allowed for a doctor to have the leeway to prescribe for any condition if he or she thinks that you know everything's been tried, there's nothing to lose. That we got right. I think we were able to prescribe any type of cannabis um, as long as it met a minimum standard. And they put the minimum standard as the GMP, Good Manufacturing Practice, EU GMP standard. That's reasonable. Then you can guarantee you've got a, a safe, reproducible, consistent product, and not any old product. So I think that was good. I think the mistakes they made were uh, not allowing general practitioners to prescribe <coughs> primary care physicians, and only only specialists can pr prescribe in the UK. That's a bas <coughs> basically a hospital doctor, hospital specialist, a neurologist, or pain specialist or paediatrician. That's a mistake because I think GPs would be very good prescribers because they're used to seeing, managing the symptoms. They're not used to diagnosing complicated conditions, but they're used to managing the symptoms resulting from them. So they might not diagnose multiple sclerosis, but the GP is very good at managing the muscle spasm or the pain or the anxiety or the sleep problem after the diagnosis. So I think if Romania had to learn something is let any doctor prescribe it. Um, the other thing, the mistake they made, I think, is allowing any doctor to prescribe it, any specialist, without training. So they, they and that's the tradition in the UK, is the government doesn't um, prescribe medical training. It's up to the medical profession to sort out its own training. But actually, the medical profession hasn't sorted out its own training. And we're getting some doctors prescribing who just don't know what they're doing. And that doesn't help the patients, and it doesn't help the cause. Because you've only got to get some silly doctor to prescribe too much cannabis or, and get the person sells it on the black market or gets a psychotic episode because they've been prescribed it wrongly. It will reduce the, the, um, the perception of how safe cannabis is if it's used properly. So we must have a training program. So I think we got, we got the doctors who can prescribe wrong, should have been GPs as well as specialists, and we got the lack of educational mm -hmm. support. 
And we've corrected that because we've put on, I run a thing called the Academy of Medical Cannabis. So there is now training available, but it's not by the government, it's by, by me or people who just said, we must do some training here. So I think in Romania, there's some less good lessons to learn from the UK, but also there's one or two things you could do better. Um, I also, what I would like is in government terms for the whole of cannabis to be run from a separate office like Holland. They have an office for medicinal cannabis. So they're responsible for importing regulations, for, for con uh, quality control, for supervising research, supervising the doctors, uh, supervising the products, the dispensaries. Everything to do with medical cannabis is in one government department. And we haven't done that in the UK. A bit is in this department, in that department, another bit in that department, and the, they don't coordinate with each other. So getting a Romanian Office of Medicinal Cannabis, I think is also going to be quite important to get everything properly coordinated. Perfect. Thank you very much. And I, um, I am thanking you in advance because um, we would need from uh, your experience uh, some trainings in Romania. So yeah. um, I am thanking you again here publicly now uh, because uh, uh, I have some doctors that are um, that want to learn more about the subject, and I hope that uh, you could help us because yeah. uh, I think that it's very, very important, as you said, if we start to prescribe cannabis, to do it correctly and yeah. give the patient the confidence that he takes something supervised by a professional who has some experience or at least has yes. education in this matter. Yes. Because uh, uh, in cannabis now we can train uh, ourselves through a lot of courses, we can read a lot, but I believe that um, a professional like you, who has experience with patients, uh, is more important uh, to, uh, to give advice to other doctors and to, I don't know, to recommend them the yes. doses. It's not like the first time you, that you try it and then you adjust it. Now you already know some important yeah. points and uh, some other people could benefit directly from you and some other professionals and yeah. uh, in the end this is beneficial for the patients because they don't lose time they are losing time now but hopefully with these trainings and with the help of uh, professionals like you we could just help them in not losing time some more time so yeah, thank no, you I'm very happy to teach. I can do that online. I do that online because of COVID in the UK at the moment. We do do it on Zoom or something. So in English, I'm afraid I'm, I don't speak Romanian that well. Right. But um, yeah, no. and I think it's very important. You're quite right. Training right. the doctors properly is uh, is really vital. For now, you don't speak Romanian because uh, you have some fans in Romania. Uh, I also discuss a lot about you. I am guilty of <laughs> uh, because I'm uh, talking about you proudly, and I'm saying that you, for me, you are a, a, I don't know, a very good example on how a doctor uh, is fighting for the right of the patients. So we need yeah. more doctors like you because. Uh, as we talked the other time, uh, we are, a lot of charities, a lot of NGOs, a lot of patients are fighting by themselves or in groups. But doctors, not so many. So I know you, I know another wonderful doctor in Malta, but not so many doctors want to, I don't know, to be like the first in line, you know. So yeah. I appreciate yeah. you very much and I uh, talk with uh, all the Romanians that uh, listen to me. I'm uh, giving them uh, okay. your example. <laughs> so thank you very much. It's very important and hopefully some other doctors could also follow your example because it's not a, it's, it's a very important fight what you're doing. And for some patients, even though what you said, maybe some patients will not be cured, but for, for some patients, uh, this could also change their lives. So, yes. in a good sense of way, some, for, for some patients, this could uh, could be another chance of uh, life, you know, so... Yeah, I agree. Good. 
And you no, keep you. fighting and you're doing a great job over there. I hope you succeed. Thank you very much because of you with your help and with the uh, other. Uh, yes, to, to help. So and I'm you. very happy to come across as soon as we can and meet you and meet the people there and do some teaching or whatever. Thank you very much. And uh, before the trainings and the, uh, before the classes, uh, maybe we could, uh, if you have news or uh, I mean, if you have a message, uh, if you want to share with us some uh, news from UK or worldwide or in the cannabis industry, um, please uh, let me know because I would uh, do another interview with you whenever you okay. want, another podcast. Uh, we need information and uh, even though we have a lot of information on the internet, um, people don't know how to separate uh, the true information from false Yes, that's very so, true. There's a lot of nonsense on the internet. Good. Yes. And, yes. So, thank yes. you again, Professor okay. Barnes. Not at all. That's good. Thank you for today. Okay. Yeah. All right. All our best wishes. Thank you. Bye-bye. Love to Maria. I hope she's, has she been sleeping okay? Yes, she's sleeping still. I don't know how, but she's sleeping. Thank you very okay. much, Professor. All right.